uh, dear facilitator Ramanda and our most valuable participants and the team. Uh, good morning and uh, welcome to this very important workshop on career development in monitoring and evaluation for the young and emerging evaluators. It is one of the most important workshops in this conference in the context of building capacities of the young and emerging evaluators. My name is Rajiv Nandi. Uh, I'm a co-leader of Evaluation Community of India and uh, also one of the members of the organizing committee for the event. <clears throat> you know, uh, mere knowing of certain technical tools doesn't make one an evaluator. One needs to build the right perspective in this journey to become an evaluator. This workshop will focus on both self-awareness and how to overcome challenges apart from building competencies in, in technical knowledge and skills towards developing a career in monitoring and evaluation. I'm sure it would be an immensely valuable learning session for all of us in building and strengthening our career. Hope you will enjoy this workshop. Now I'd like to hand over the mic to Mr. Asela Kalugampiti, the president of API. Over to Asela. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rajiv, uh, for uh, the welcoming remarks. And uh, I also uh, warmly welcome all the participants uh, and uh, Amanda, our facilitator, and uh, our production team as well. This is the first day of the uh, conference, Third Asia Pacific Evaluation Association Conference and Evalfest 2022. Uh, we start with workshops, and uh, this workshop uh, we have you know half a, half a day today and tomorrow the second half. Uh, thank you for uh, registering for this uh, workshop. And as Dr. Rajiv mentioned, uh, this is career development in monitoring and evaluation for young and emerging evaluators. Young and emerging evaluators is very important uh, uh, group for all of us uh, because uh, we are talking about professionalization of evaluation, professionalization uh, and uh, professional development. We see with uh, young and emerging evaluators mainly because uh, evaluation is not yet a profession. So in this uh, case, uh, now we are we are talking about young and emerging evaluators, and even in Asia Pacific region, young and emerging evaluators uh, are uh, important uh, part of the regional evaluation strategy as well. So in this case, uh, so uh, in the regional evaluation strategy also, we have uh, young and emerging evaluators uh, as you know uh, one of the themes, and. Uh, so this workshop will definitely contribute to uh, uh, professional development of young and emerging evaluators. And at the same time, uh, this conference is supported by UNFP Evaluation Office and uh, Global Environmental Facility, uh, uh, Jeff Evaluation Office. And uh, both the organizations provided uh, bursaries for uh, participants to attend this conference, especially for young and emerging evaluators. So I'm happy that you take the advantage of uh, this opportunity and uh, participating in this conference. Uh, and I'm also looking forward to uh, this first workshop uh, at the same time. So Amanda Motashet, I hope Amanda, I uh, pronounced your second name correctly, <laughs> if not my apologies. Uh, she is facilitating this workshop. Uh, for these uh, two days, today half a day and tomorrow half a day. And uh, she actually developed this training module on behalf of UNFP Evaluation Office as you know, uh, umbrella initiative to develop uh, career development uh, in monitoring and evaluation. And uh, she already uh, you know, uh, delivered this training module at the winter school in uh, Asia Pacific as well in last December. And this is the first time we are having you know longer session, one day session on uh, this training module. So this is a new, brand new training module delivered to you. Uh, so we are also really excited about this. And Amanda is from Western Australia and she herself is a young and emerging evaluator. So with this note, Amanda, uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, facilitating this uh, workshop and all the participants, you have opportunity to uh, actively engage in the workshop. There are uh, several uh, uh, breakout sessions and other opportunities to engage uh, actively, please do so. And also you can share your questions and uh, comments in the chat bar as well. And our production team is uh, ready to help you. With this note, 
I pass the floor to Amanda. And you already know about some of the uh, reminders for the participants. Please uh, rename uh, yourself if your full name is not there, your country, full uh, first name and last name. Please keep your microphone uh, and video disabled uh, because then uh, there's no disturbance to others. Uh, and always uh, share your questions and uh, comments in the chat bar. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, Amanda, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Asela, for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, I'm just going to share my slides. Okay, so hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to echo what Dr. Rajiv and Asela said. Uh, we really welcome you to this, this session, and I'm really excited about how many people have shown an interest in this session. Um, and very excited to um, work through this content with you, and I hope that you all find this, this very useful. Um, so as Asela mentioned, my name's Amanda. I am a young and emerging evaluator from Australia. Uh, and I have developed this training material as part of a joint initiative uh, led by Eval Youth, Global Evaluation Initiative, the P2P Career Advisory Sessions and the UNFPA Evaluation Office. So this training forms one part of the broader initiative, which is really with a focus on, on young and emerging evaluators, which as Asela said, we know is, is a very important part of, of the evaluation sector moving forward. So, Again, I would like to welcome you and say thank you very much for, for being a part of this. Um, and I really look forward to your, your active engagement and participation with the materials. So this is the first session of two. So we will be back tomorrow with um, new content and new exercises to continue the learning journey. Um, but for today, I would like to start with a little uh, introduction. Um, so we have six modules um, to this training that we will be covering between today's session and tomorrow's session. So the first, we are going to look at why you may want to pursue a career in evaluation. Secondly, we will look at what some of the careers available in the evaluation sector are. In module three, we'll cover the core competencies of a professional evaluator. Uh, in module four, we will be building technical knowledge and skills. And so this is the content that we will cover tomorrow, sorry, today. And then tomorrow we will also cover the self-awareness of your competencies and planning your next steps and overcoming challenges. So from these two sessions, what we'd really like to do is to equip you with some skills and give you some guidance so that you are able to plan your next steps for your career and to identify where ultimately you would like to, to go and progress in the career in your career rather. So that is what we will be covering broadly today and tomorrow. Um, just a brief agenda here. I think you have already received this, um, but we will cover this introductory material and then we'll have module one, module two, and we'll have a, a quick break of only five minutes. And then we'll come back and discuss the core competencies and have a slightly longer break of 10 minutes then come back and do the final module and a brief conclusion and looking forward to tomorrow's session. So overall, the session will be four hours. So we'll be finishing at um, 1 p.m. IST. Uh, so I look forward to, to hearing from you during this session up until that point. Okay, so with this training, we have two uh, broad objectives that we'd like to, to achieve. Firstly, we really want to build understanding of the reality and the requirements of a career in evaluation. And secondly, to provide information about career pathways and where to access further information and opportunities. Within those objectives, we have six key training outcomes. And so firstly, we hope that you are motivated to pursue a career in evaluation. We hope that you are able to identify opportunities for furthering your career. We hope that you understand the core competencies of a professional um, evaluator. That you are aware of how to build technical knowledge and skills. That you're self-aware of your own skills and abilities, including your strengths and gaps. And that you're able to overcome potential challenges with furthering your, your career. 
So in the sessions today, we'll be using um, a few of the functions of Zoom. So we'll be using some polls. There is also the participant workbook, which you received via email um, and production team. If we could get the link to that posted in the chat as well, please. Um, so that if you have not been able to access the workbook so far, you can access it via this link. Um, it is a link to a Google Doc. Uh, you won't be able to edit, but you should be able to download that document there. So uh, if you have uh, yet to access the workbook, I really encourage you to do that because we will be using it quite heavily throughout the session. And so it will really help you to have access to that. Okay, and then sadly we'll be using breakout rooms. Um, I'm not sure how many participants we will end up with, but we did have a lot of registrations for this session. So it may not be possible for everybody to feed back from the breakout rooms. So it may work a little differently to breakout rooms that you're used to. So mm -hmm. what I have done is I've developed a little process for you all within your, your breakout rooms. So there'll be four broad stages. Uh, the first one will be to introduce yourselves. Each breakout room will be randomly assigned. So it will be good to spend a few moments to get to know each other. Secondly is to nominate a facilitator and a documenter. So the facilitator's job is to make sure that the discussion is ongoing and focused on the content. And the documenter will be responsible for reporting back via the chat. Number three will be to complete the exercise. So within each breakout room, you will have an exercise to complete. And number four is to summarize the three key discussion points uh, from the, the discussion. And so the documenter will post those in the chat when we return to the main group. And one more important point on the breakout rooms is to remember to take note of your group number. So before you are split into your breakout rooms, it will come up with a message saying that you're being requested to join breakout room number, whichever, um, and you need to take note of that group number because that will be important for reporting back into the chat. Okay, so that is a lot of the, the housekeeping out of the way. So to move into more of the content for today, I thought I would start with a, an overview of, of the value of evaluation and particularly the value of good evaluation practice. So if you look at the definition there of evaluation combines evidence with sound ways of thinking about value-based criteria or sometimes principles. So if we take that to mean good evaluation practice combines evidence and sound ways of thinking value-based criteria, those are the key parts of evaluation. So then what is the value of those processes? So firstly, it can provide evidence to inform policy making. So this is something that is especially coming to the fore uh, more and more about the value of evaluation to provide evidence and inform sound policy making that is really grounded in re reality. Secondly, evaluation can act as a voice for individuals not always included in decision-making processes. So good evaluation practice engages a range of stakeholders and by engaging all of those people, we can really include them in processes that they may not otherwise have a voice in. Evaluation can facilitate adaptive management. So providing information about what does or doesn't work can inform shifts in programs or projects or even more broadly approaches by an organization. So that adaptive management is a really key value of evaluation. It can provide evidence for activism and social justice. Again, this is something that's really coming to the fore a lot more, but to be able to, to advocate and become an activist for something based on really sound evidence makes that cause uh, a lot stronger and gives you a more solid foundation to, to make those judgments. Um, it can also improve transparency and inform and empower citizens. Uh, so improving transparency, good evaluation practice shares back to the, uh, the people involved and can be shared more broadly as well. Uh, and so that can inc increase transparency and can inform and empower citizens with that knowledge. Uh, next, it can enhance government and organisational learning. So beyond that first point there of um, providing evidence to inform policy making, it can enhance broader learning as well. So understanding what does and doesn't work can really help with um, future projects and programs 
and ensuring that the best possible results are achieved. So in terms of the value of evaluation, quite broadly, good evaluation practice can contribute to all of these things. And I think that's really important to keep in mind uh, in your pursuit of good evaluation practice. With this next slide here, I wanted to introduce some of the key building blocks of an evaluation career. So as, as Dr. Rajiv was mentioning at the start, uh, skills are not all that is required for a career in evaluation. There are many other things that provide a solid foundation on which your skills can be built. So these are important to keep in mind while you are developing your career. This can be an evaluative attitude and capacity. So this may be that you're, you're curious, you want to know how things, um, how things work and why something is. And evaluation is a good way to investigate and pursue that. You may have a passion for evaluation whether that be any aspects of the value that we discussed before or some of the aspects we may discuss in module one. Your evaluative experience is also very important, um, but also on the second row there, having varied experience, so having experience in different sectors as well. And all of that combines with your core evaluation skills and that provides solid stepping stones towards a successful career in evaluation. Okay, so now that we've covered some of that introductory material, we will move on into module one, which is about why you may want to pursue a career in evaluation. So the purpose of this module is to identify what it is about evaluation that really resonates with you. Uh, so you'll be presented with some aspects of evaluation that make it a, an interesting and challenging career, and you'll be able to identify which parts of that resonate most with you. And this may help you to identify your next career steps and to understand really where you want to go and why. So with that in mind, I will run through some of the, the benefits of a career in evaluation. So evaluation can take you to new contexts. So pre-COVID, this would have been that evaluation can take you to many new places. You can travel the world with evaluation. It's a little less so at the moment, but nonetheless, evaluation can take you to new contexts. So you can have experiences that you would not have with many other jobs. You can hear from stakeholders that you would not normally meet um, without evaluation. So that's one uh, exciting benefit of a career in evaluation. Evaluation is cross-sectoral. So almost all, every sector needs evaluation. So you can really tailor it to, to your interests and to what sector you are interested in. Opportunities are varied. So lots of different contexts need evaluation as well as sectors. So from kind of community development all the way up to international sustainable development. There are so many opportunities and they are all very varied. Uh, so you can, can choose from there what interests you the most. A career in evaluation can also be very flexible. Uh, this links a little with the cross-sectoral aspect of the opportunities that are available to you um, are very broad. And so you have a lot of flexibility to pick which opportunities you want to pursue based on your own interests, your own experiences and your own skills. Evaluation is exciting and evolving. Um, this one is um, I think very exciting. So uh, evaluation is constantly uh, reinventing itself a little with new approaches, new methods, new ways of using evidence, new ways of collecting evidence. Um, and so there's always opportunities for learning within evaluation as well. Another aspect of this link, links to the cross-sectoral point where because you can be involved in so many different sectors, the information that you have to absorb for each uh, new project is very varied. And so it means that you can become a bit of a, an overnight expert on lots of different topics. So the way that it's uh, continuously learning and evolving is I think a really exciting point about evaluation. You can be a driver of positive change. So as I mentioned at the start with the value of, sorry, value of evaluation slide, you can collect evidence for changes, which can create a multitude of positive effects uh, on people's lives more broadly. 
the opportunities are increasing. So the demand for evaluation is actually increasing as well as the sector, as the seller mentioned, is becoming more professional and being recognised more as a profession. The demand for evaluation is also increasing as it is being mandated in more contexts um, and being required by more types of projects. Um, and so the opportunities are increasing, which is exciting for those of us entering into a career. You can also contribute to, in many ways, using evaluation. I will touch on this a little bit more in this next slide. You can contribute to improved outcomes. As I mentioned at the start, increasing knowledge about what does and doesn't work means that you can influence the outcomes of a project or program. You can inform decision making and making sure that those decisions are based on, on solid evidence um, and that they are the best for, for all stakeholders. In terms of accountability, you can really track investments through knowing what has been achieved from which activities and which inputs. So that's important in terms of accountability. In terms of sustainable development, uh, this is another kind of higher level contribution of evaluation, I guess, but pursuing good evaluation practice can contribute to this. We know that the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development includes evaluation for follow-up. And so pursuing good evaluation practice can contribute here as well. You can contribute to broader knowledge generation by understanding what activities result in which outputs and outcomes, um, and that can help for broader organisational knowledge as well. Best use of resources. So this is linked a little bit with the accountability option, but again, you can track investments and know that which money being spent where is contributing to which results. You can contribute to social change. Again, having that evidence to act as an, an activist or an advocate for social change can be a really powerful contribution of good evaluation practice. And increased equity and inclusiveness. So again, those stakeholders that may not ordinarily be involved can be included here. Uh, and that can contribute to increased equity and in terms of the sustainable development uh, terminology, no one left behind. So that's another contribution of good evaluation practice. Um, so I know that some of these can sound a little intimidating, um, being put squarely on your own shoulders. So I wanted to highlight some of the ways that young and emerging evaluators in particular can contribute. So in terms of the knowledge of interventions to be evaluated, you may have specific knowledge or experiences with one of the interventions, which can be really helpful in evaluation. We bring new skill sets. So this includes, but isn't just limited to IT skills, which have obviously come to the fore a lot more during the pandemic with remote uh, evaluations being conducted more often. Dynamism, so this is also important in terms of um, young and emerging evaluators' passion about social change and sustainable development. Um, and I think the acknowledgement that evaluation can contribute to these things means that young and emerging evaluators have a specific contribution here because as we are entering the field, this contribution is being recognised. Sustainability of evaluation. Uh, so this is in terms of uh, the evaluation practice in general. So because we are maybe slightly younger, we have slightly longer careers. And so we can um, progress evaluation and continue good evaluation practice for, for longer. And especially if we can pass these skills on to other people, other young and emerging evaluators, this further helps with the sustainability of evaluation. Uh, we may also have particular passion for, for particular topics. So in terms of um, environment or uh, inclusiveness, equity, those kind of passion is really helpful in driving forward a career in evaluation and driving forward the evaluation sector as well. So as I said, I know that some of these um, other bubbles can seem quite high level, but know that you do have a specific contribution to make and you can contribute to these these bigger contributions of good evaluation practice. Okay, that's um, a lot of me talking. So I'm going to let some other people do some talking now. We're going to hear from three different expert evaluators about why they enjoy the profession of evaluation 
and why they wanted to pursue the career. So as you're listening to these videos, I'd like you to think about what part of their stories resonate with you. Do you share some of the same evaluation, passion, motivation or interest? Or is there something completely different that draws you to evaluation that either these experts don't mention or that I also haven't mentioned yet? So I think there's space in your workbook for you to consider these as you listen to the videos. And so with that, I would like to play this video from Deborah Rugg. Uh, so Deborah is the Founder, Executive Director and Professor at Claremont Evaluation Centre. So this is Deborah talking about why she became an evaluator. Becoming a professional evaluator maybe is a lifelong process that you evolve into over time. The need to uh, next assess your own motivation for doing evaluation is really, really important. Are you motivated to do evaluation, to, to find, um, to apply methodologies and, and do uh, the latest um, evaluation uh, studies to give to just advance the field or to help inform a uh, agency? Are you really keen on account of the public accountability and holding people to account? Um, or do you want people to really uh, learn lessons and improve programs? Um, or do you want to change the system or all of it? And Okay, so that was very helpful from Deborah. We can hear about some of the really varied contributions that you can make to the evaluation sector. Becoming a professional. Next, we're going to hear from our very own Asela Kalagampitia. Sorry, Asela, I think I um, put your last name there as well. I became a um, so Asela is the president of APIA, Asia Pacific Evaluation Association, and also the National Evaluation Capacity Development Specialist for UNFPA. I you mentioned my name correctly. Yeah. Sorry? Thank you. You, you pronounce my name correctly, thank you. Oh, good, thanks. <laughs> I became a many officer when I was young, uh, like 25 years ago, but accidentally. I was the program person. I was, you know, involved in programming. And then uh, the many officer uh, left the organization and I was promoted as the many officer. That's how I became a many officer. But I was, I, I, I liked very much the MNE uh, officer position, where I learned about evaluation very much, but there were no uh, many opportunities to learn at that time. I know that now uh, young evaluators and people who are entering the profession have a lot of opportunities, training, academic courses, but at that time, uh, rare opportunities, I must say. And we had to learn uh, by doing it as well as, you know, through other uh, colleagues and uh, 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 friends and uh, I think as Marco said as evaluators definitely we can contribute to success uh, or improvement of programming and uh, make difference in uh, people's lives that is the best thing I have you know ever learned in my career life as an evaluator that as evaluators we are contributing to better lives of people by bringing evidence and you know uh, uh, advocating to use evidence that is one thing uh, and at the same time uh, i think uh, uh, when i got some opportunities to learn about evaluation through different uh, courses in that of course and some other training courses i was able to expand horizons of uh, evaluation uh, my evaluation profession okay so thank you to pastor seller there for the, the video um, many important points there about the contribution you can make to changing people's lives, um, which I think is is a very good um, thing to, to strive for. Um, but Estella also made another good point in the video, and that was the contribution of the combination of skills and experience and of experience in actually gaining skills and implementing those. So that was a very important video. Thank you, Estella. Okay, and then the last person we're going to hear from I became a many is Larry Bremner. So Larry is the founder of Aval Indigenous um, as part of the Global Aval Partners Network. He now works in um, education evaluation. 
Evaluation has provided me with the opportunity to uh, work with unbelievably wonderful, dedicated people around the world who are really working hard to uh, to improve the lives of of youth, of adult learners, of communities. And so, for me, uh, the reason you become an evaluator is to you can't change the whole world, but I always say if you can help change a little bit of the world to make it better for the people who live in that particular piece of the world, then that's all the reason you have for living and for being an evaluator. Okay, also very helpful from Larry there in terms of localizing some of those those broad contributions we were discussing at the start. So in terms of the contribution to sustainable development and changing people's lives, but to be able to recognize that you don't have to make that at the, the global level. You could everybody please mute themselves if they're not? Oh, there we go. Um, so in terms of localizing some of that impact and that contribution you can make and making it at a smaller scale where it is a little less daunting um, and recognizing that you may not be able to change the entire world, but that you, like Larry said, can change a part of the world for some people. Okay, so now that we have heard from some experts in the field um, and you've heard about some of the aspects of evaluation that are really, um, you know, interesting and exciting, I'd like you to think about your own motivations for pursuing a career in evaluation. So the first exercise in your workbook, I think it's on page four, contains a table and it has the areas of evaluation that I've discussed already. And then it has three columns. And so in the first one, if you could think about which reasons for pursuing evaluation really appeal to you. So what aspects do you like the most? In the second column, think about your interests. Which aspects interest you the most? This may be slightly different from what appeals to you. And in the third column, think about your inspiration and where you think you can make the greatest contribution. Now, in your instructions in your workbook, it does say that you um, can place numbers next to all of them. But if you only get as far as the first 10 or five, that is also fine. Um, I will give you about five minutes to complete this one and we will come back um, and have a brief poll about this one so you can see what other people's motivations are as well. Uh, if you've had any trouble accessing the workbook, uh, please pop it in the chat and we will help you. Thank you, Randy, for posting the link. Oh, thank you for the update on the page number. It looks like it is page six instead of page seven. Ah, oh, sorry, page four. One of one participant has raised hands. Ah, sure, please unmute. If you have a, a question or a comment, please feel free to, to unmute. Ah. Or pop in the chat if that is easy for you, if you have a question. This station is Charlie Bazaar. Doors will open on the right. Please mind the gap between the platform and the train. 
no problems if you're not able to do the exercise yet. Um, you may be able to participate in the polls which are coming up, so you will be able to participate somewhat. Okay, we'll have another two minutes on this um, exercise and then we will do the polls for feedback. Okay, there's a question in the chat to explain the difference in the three aspects. So the appeal may be which reasons you, you like the most. So you may like the sound of it being cross-sectoral, but then you may be interested by the fact that it can take you to new contexts. So they may be slightly different um, in terms of, of what you like the sound of, but what you'd actually be interested to pursue. And then the inspiration is where you think you can make the greatest contribution. So in terms of you pursuing good evaluation practice, where do you think the best contribution can be made? It may be that it is the same across all three fields for you, but it is just to see if there is any difference um, between the three for you. And again, no problem if you are unable to do the exercise, um, you may be able to participate in the polls which will be coming up. Okay, so the final minute of the exercise, um, if you haven't had a chance to number all of the columns, um, please just identify your top one for each of these. Uh, and that is what the, the poll will ask. Okay, I think we will move on now. Um, so if I could ask the production team to please share the first round of polls. So what we'd like you to do with these polls is to select the aspect of evaluation that came up as the top for you across these three. So you'll see the first question at the top there and you'll have to scroll down for the second and third questions. Again, please pick the one that came out on top for you for what you like, what interests you and where you can make the greatest contribution. So the first one there is on what appeals to you the most. And if you scroll down to the second question, that is on what interests you the most. And the third question is what, on, is what inspires you the most. Great, we're starting to see some of those responses come in.
Okay, it looks like we're having a little bit of a lag. So I think that everybody who would like to vote in the polls maybe has. Um, a quick question for the production team. Are you happy for me to share the results or um, is somebody else going to do that? Okay, that's great. So I think you should all be able to see now uh, what each of you have said. Uh, and so we can see in the first question that there's a lot of people that like the idea of being a driver of change. So that's exciting. That means we have lots of, of passionate people about the value and the potential of evaluation. And that looks like it is followed by the uh, contribution to development. Uh, so that's also quite similar to dr a driver of change. So that again is very exciting. In the second one about what interests people the most, we have slightly different. So driver of change still comes up quite high, but the aspect of continuous learning also comes up high, uh, which I have to say I echo. I find that a very exciting aspect of evaluation. And the idea of it being cross-sectoral as well is something that interests a lot of you. So the broad potential of evaluation. And then moving on to the last question, the what area of evaluation do you think you can make the greatest contribution to? Let's have a look. Okay, this is great. So a lot of people feeling that they can make a contribution to development. So in terms of equity and inclusiveness, sustainable development. We've got 14 responses there out of 39. So that's a really high proportion. That's exciting. And the next highs there is about contributing to programming shifts in terms of improved outcomes, best use of resources, those kinds of things. So people really excited to be able to make a change um, and recognizing the potential and the value of evaluation. So that's really great. Um, I hope that has been, been helpful for you to look at some of your own motivations for pursuing a career. And as we can see, there is a variety of reasons that you may want to pursue a career. And even within our group here, we have quite a variety of people, of motivations within the group. So that's exciting and will contribute and help in the future discussions throughout the rest of the session. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing those responses. Um, Okay, so that uh, really is the end of module one mostly. Um, so I want to just pause here for any questions that you may have. Um, bearing in mind that we will have a lot more content to come. This is really the introductory module. So if you do have any questions about the content in that module or the exercise, please feel free to pop them in the chat or, or unmute yourself and ask. Okay, it doesn't seem like there's anything coming up there. So I will we'll move on to module two, um, but please feel free to keep posting questions in the chat as they arise as well. Module two is about careers in evaluation and what a career pathway may look like. So to start with, I would like to situate um, and illustrate the evaluation career landscape uh, so that you can identify where your current position uh, is situated in relation to other options and where you may like to progress into the future. And firstly, if we think about it in very broad terms, most sectors are made up of a supply and a demand side. So on the supply side, we have evaluators. So these are people with the skills and expertise to actually conduct evaluations. This may be employees or consultants, think tanks, consultancy firms, volunteer evaluators, but also evaluation networks. So like your voluntary organization for professional evaluation or your VOPE, eval youth, eval partners, those kind of networks. And then on the demand side, we have those people that are commissioning evaluation. So this may be the, the public sector in terms of governments, could be the private sector like foundations or businesses, or it may be the international development sector, multilateral organizations, NGOs, development banks, those kind of um, development actors. 
It's also important to note that many roles can act as both. So the example there, a government may want to undertake an evaluation of a project they are doing, but they may also have an internal um, evaluation unit. So they have the internal capacity to supply the required expertise. So on top of the broad demand and supply sides, we also have some roles which are considered peripheral roles. And so these are roles that are not specifically m and &E roles, but they use lots of m and &E skills. So this may be something like a grant manager who has to assess uh, different applications that they receive and they may use evaluation. And then we have a final... Um, oh, sorry, noted about the slowdown. I will slow down. Um, and so the fourth section there is about the evaluation capacity building and knowledge generation. So this is universities, research institutions, mentorship programs or evaluation campaigns. And so these are people who pass evaluation skills onto others for the evaluation capacity building part or who contribute to broader evaluation knowledge through the knowledge generation part. Now, in terms of that landscape, there have been a lot of shifts in this, um, this space. And so I thought I would touch on what some of the most important ones have been in recent years. Firstly, there's an increasing demand for the ability to evaluate complexity and context-aware evaluation. This is in terms of particularly some of the big topics which cross over multiple sectors and multiple contexts. So things like climate change um, is a global, a global issue which is really going to require some of these key skills. And so there's an increasing focus on that and an increasing demand accordingly. There's a shift to increase emphasis on participatory methods. So as I mentioned, there's a recognition that good evaluation practice engages a range of stakeholders and that there's opportunities for these people to, to participate and really contribute to the evaluation outcomes. Cross-cutting issues like human rights, gender mainstreaming and sustainability. Uh, they have been recognised as important within evaluations for, for many years, but they are becoming more and more kind of mainstreamed, I guess. So it used to be that they were quite specialised areas and you would have a, a gender specialist on your team. There's increasing demand for evaluators who can include consideration of these issues in their broader evaluation practice rather than as a, a specialist area. Uh, there's an increasing focus to engage national staff. This has particularly come to the fore during the COVID pandemic. So as international um, evaluators have been unable to travel to areas, there's been a focus on building national evaluation capacity and engaging national staff to conduct a lot of the field work um, and to contribute through the context and their knowledge of the context. There's an increased focus on the potential of evaluation for transformation. So this was something that you all identified through your responses to the polls, that there's the idea that evaluation can contribute to positive change and transformation and recognising that is really important. And there's also the identification and understanding of the roles evaluators can play as advocates for social change. Um, so this is somewhat linked to the previous um, point, but it goes a little further to say that the evaluation sector is changing a little from only being able to provide evidence to decision makers and that's all but to be able to use that evidence to inform social change and to structure that uh, in such a way as to, to act as an advocate is something that's coming to the fore a little bit um, 
and again comes up in your poll responses and as one of the contributions that you can make as professional evaluators moving forwards. Okay, I thought next that I would talk about some of the key career pathways. So there are some key questions that people have about a career in evaluation. Um, and so I thought I would cover some of those now. The first point to note is that one at the top there, that there is no single career pathway for evaluation. Everybody has a different story. You could talk to 10 different evaluators and get 10 different stories about how they became evaluators. So this is an important note to say, don't um, compare your evaluation pathway to somebody else's because there are so many that everybody can be on a different pathway and still be on the way to being an evaluator. Okay, so the first of the two questions that I wanted to cover is a lot of people have questions about if you have to be specialised on a particular topic or if you can remain a, keep a broad focus um, in evaluation. So the first point is to say that both of these options are valid. Um, so they are both feasible. They have slightly different considerations and slightly different benefits. So I'll run through some of those, but it is really up to personal choice. On the broad side, some of the benefits may be the variety of work that you can undertake. So as we mentioned, evaluation is required in a lot of different sectors. And so if you maintain the broad focus, you can maybe work in a lot of those different sectors and pursue quite a variety of work. There may be more opportunities available. So because of that variety of work, you can work in more spaces. And so there are more opportunities available. And there may be more flexibility of what you can work on. So if you are specialised, you may only be able to work in that one field. But if you maintain the broad focus, you may be able to work in lots of different fields. On the specialised side, you can choose the topic and context. So this is linked again to the cross-sectoral. It's required everywhere. So you can choose which topic and which uh, context you want to specialize in and you want to pursue. Because of that, it's really tailor, sorry, tailorable to your interests and to what you enjoy. So you can really choose to find something you're very interested and passionate about and you can pursue that. And again, you have the flexibility to choose a thematic area or a method. So what you specialize in can be really varied. It may be a topic, a context, a thematic area, a method or a sector. So there's lots of choice there before you specialize. Okay, um, the next point to make is that um, even if you choose a either the broad or the specialised approach at this stage, you can shift between them. So it's not that you have to pick one path and completely follow it. There are ways to move between them. So I thought I would cover what some of the, the main considerations are for each of the broad or specialised areas. So for the broad, um, if you want to pursue the broad pathway, you need to diversify and add to your skills and experience. So this may require volunteer experience. So if you think about the fact that you want to, to add a new experience, you may not, <clears throat> excuse me, you may not have uh, experience to demonstrate that is relevant to where you want to go. Um, and so you may be less competitive for a paid role or a paid contract in that area. But if you can identify a volunteer role, you may be able to gain experience there. And then the next time you want to go for a paid role, you will have that experience. And the second point there is to identify organisations with varied thematic strengths. So you think about a lot of the UN agencies have quite specific mandates. Um, so UNEP is very environment focused, um, but you may be wanting to be more broad than that. Um, so things like maybe consulting companies or setting up as an independent consultant may have a greater range of work available to you. Um, and then on the specialised side, what you specialise in to start with may depend on your previous work. 
So for instance, if you are transitioning from statistics, it may make sense for you to go straight towards quantitative analysis. Or if you are coming from a financial background, it may make sense to become an efficiency expert to start with. Uh, so as I mentioned, it is possible to move between the two. So even if you, you enter as a specialist in one of those areas, you can diversify and identify new areas to specialize in. Um, so the other one to bear in mind if you're pursuing the specialized pathway is to identify the topics that you are passionate about um, and tailor your career development accordingly. So if you do identify that topic or context that you want to specialize in, you can then identify the career development and professional development opportunities that are related to that. And you can highlight your previous experience in that sector or theme. So that can really strengthen an application as a specialist if you have varied knowledge related to that topic. Okay, so then the second question that I want to talk about is about the idea of being either an employee or a consultant. This is also something that um, people struggle with a little as they are setting out to know what the differences are and what the benefits of each uh, pathway may be. So some of the benefits of each, again, as with the broad and specialised, both pathways are feasible and both pathways are valid. It's really down to personal preference um, and what you prefer. So on the employee side, some of the benefits may be that there's more stability, guaranteed work, and regular hours. So they may be aspects because you are in a specific contract that um, are specialist mostly towards um, the employee role. On the consultant side, you may have more flexibility. So you can choose which um, projects you take. You may have greater autonomy over your work. You can choose which approaches or methods to apply to which contract. And there may be more varied opportunities. So uh, if you are on your own, you can pick which opportunities you want to pursue. Um, and again, as with the broad and specialised, um, pursuing one pathway at this stage in your career does not mean that you can't later pursue the other pathway. So it is possible to shift between the two. So some of the things that you need to consider on the employee side is that it's focused on your CV. So you need to build and maintain your CV, emphasize traits and experiences that will help within an organization. So things like your teamwork skills and your ability to build relationships and maintain a focus on your potential for growth. So identifying organizations that you want to, to join where there may be potential for you to still reach your, your other career goals as well. On the consultant side, there is more emphasis on your proposal writing abilities. So this is more in terms of being able to demonstrate a particular approach or method and your experience in having used that approach or method. On the business planning side, so if you were to set up as an individual consultant, you are responsible for your own business. Uh, and so being able to manage workflow, ensure that you have enough um, access to cover your overheads, Considerations like that um, are additional skills that a consultant may need, which an employee may not need as much. Uh, you can build and maintain your profile. That's in terms of networking. Uh, that can help with identifying other opportunities and being um, considered when people are looking for a consultant. Maintaining your online consultant profiles it may seem like a small and specific thing, but it can really help. Um, and can be a little time consuming. So ensuring that you have those before you decide to apply for a contract can be very helpful. And again, identifying opportunities to gain project and business management skills. These are additional skills that a consultant needs that an employee may not need as much. So being able to manage your business, but also manage an entire project um, from start to finish is something that sometimes an employee will have a project manager specifically employed. Whereas if you are an individual consultant, then you have to have those skills yourselves. Okay, 
So those are some of the specific considerations for either a broad or specialised or a employee or consultant pathway. But there are some things that help you to access pathways which are cross-cutting across all of those different pathways. So this includes researching an organisation before you apply. And so this helps you to tailor your, your application to ensure that it's responding to that organisation. Uh, and similarly, if you can know your audience, so if you can identify who may receive your application or who may be reviewing applications, you can also tailor your application to ensure that it's readable for them and that it responds to what they may be specifically looking for. Uh, to remember that both your experience and your skills are selling points, so you have to kind of include a bit of a combination in your applications, whether that be a proposal or as an employee going for a, a specific role. Um, so remember that kind of combination of experience and skills, um, and especially if you can demonstrate experiences using your skills, that is very helpful. Um, you can use a mapping exercise. We will actually do one of these exercises later, but I just wanted to introduce it at this stage. So you can map your own skills against the skills that are required in a role or a contract. And you can identify there where your strengths are, and that can help you to discuss those strengths, or you can identify where your gaps are, and this may help you to identify what professional development you need to pursue later. Okay, so those are some of the ways that you can access those um, pathways, but then what do the pathways necessarily look like? This is a very um, broad um, diagram in terms of there's generally about five um, categories for positions. So you may start at some volunteering and internship opportunities and move through entry level to mid level to higher level positions, but also to bear in mind that there are these peripheral positions as well. So the pathways that these take may look slightly different depending on your context or your organisation, but this is generally um, an overall kind of career progression pathway. Now, I know when I first entered into the um, evaluation field, I was a little confused about all of the different job titles and where each sat in relation to others. I didn't know what was a senior level or what was an entry level position. So I thought I'd just run through some of these quite briefly. Obviously, your volunteering and internship are really entry level positions. These are really helpful for you to be able to build your demonstrable experience, to be able to actually implement some of the skills that you may have learned through your education opportunities. Uh, and so the ways that you can identify these may be to approach your vope, to join networks, join mailing lists and forums. Uh, these can also be helpful for your networking and for building your profile. And there's a couple of examples there. There are many others, so I encourage you to go and have a look. Um, but yeah, look for other opportunities online. Those are just two that I am aware of. Okay, an m and &E officer is generally considered an entry level position. You have the opportunity to implement your skills and to gain new skills while still under supervision. So it's still building that experience base while still having guidance um, if required. The m &E analyst role um, is slightly higher level, but still considered at the entry level. Uh, and so this may include responsibility for the evaluation function um, for particular projects. It's a little more technical in nature than the m and &E officer. Um, and there's is still entry level because there are still supervisors above you, so you still have that guidance if you need it. The m and &E specialist um, is a bit high level, so this is considered mid-level opportunity. Um, it can be external to an organisation as well, so it may be you providing um, advice or feedback to an organisation. And it does require um, a degree of demonstrable experience and profile to be viable. 
an evaluator. This is uh, again a mid-level opportunity. Um, it's a little higher level and is quite technical. It requires knowledge of different evaluation approaches, tools and methods and you have to be able to implement and adapt those approaches and tools as needed. So this is where discussion about your experience really comes in. And so at the higher level opportunities that may be something like a MEL director, or oh, I should mention for those that may not be familiar, uh, MEL is monitoring evaluation and learning. So that is the, um, a new acronym that is coming up for M&D. Um, and so this is more high level, it's integrated with broader organisational processes, so it's less um, pure evaluate, evaluation, I guess, uh, and includes more about the organisational processes. The higher level opportunity for the consultant pathway would be a team leader, so this is um, a high level, it requires team management expertise and project management as you are responsible for the entire contract or project. Um, so some of the peripheral opportunities, I think I mentioned this one at the start, but a grant manager may use some m and &E skills to assess applications, but isn't a strictly m and &E role. And on a researcher side, this is less of a practical role and more of a knowledge generation role. So this is really suited for those of you with an interest in the analytical or theoretical aspects of evaluation. Okay, so just to summarise those ones that we have talked through, um, as I mentioned, these, this progression may look a little different depending on your organisation or your context. But generally you have volunteering and internship roles that are an essential step for you to build your, uh, your skills and your experience which can help you to achieve an entry level position, which includes m and &E officers and m and &E analysts, mid-level positions, which include m and &E specialists, evaluator or consultants, and the higher level positions, which may be a MEL uh, director or consultant team leader, and not to forget those peripheral positions. This may also include something like a project or program design officer who uses m and &E evidence in future design. Okay, so we're going to have a, a brief exercise there so that you can think more about your own career pathways and how this interacts with everything else that we've been talking about. So again, apologies if I have the wrong page number, but I think it's page seven of your workbook. There is a big version of the evaluation career landscape that is blank. And so what I'd like you to do is to use dots and solid lines to identify where your positions to date have been. So since you entered the evaluation um, sector, where you have worked. And then think about where you'd like to move next and use a dotted line to identify where that sits in relation to where you currently are. So I'll give you probably five minutes for this one and then we will feed back using polls like we did for the second one. Um, but in the meantime, if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Uh -huh. Good point in the chat about asking if this is relevant for people who are just starting out. Uh, if you have not ever worked in evaluation or you are not currently working in evaluation, then you can just identify where you think you would like to be in evaluation. So you can just pop a, a dot or a, um, a circle in which area you would like to be working. Oh, thank you, Yatin, for the um, update on the page numbers. Oh, good. I'm glad you're finding the exercise helpful. Responding to the comment in the chat. OK, we have another comment in the chat from Sabina about um, learning while practicing. Um, and I think this will come to the fore a little more in one of our modules, but I think it's a really useful way to actually implement your learning and to be able to understand how it works in practice um, and in reality, there may be, you know, um, unforeseen circumstances that may impact how you actually use some of the skills that you're learning. So I think that learning while practicing is, is really important if you have the opportunity. I think it can really strengthen the skills that you learn to be able to actually implement them. 
I hope that um, answers your question. Okay, I think we will have one more minute on the exercise, um, if that is enough. If you need slightly longer, please let me know in the chat. Okay, another question in the chat from Musomi. I hope I pronounced your name correctly there. Um, regarding theory versus m and tools and skills, there are some courses that are more on the theory side. Um, and how does one ensure that they get better on the skills side? I think uh, in terms of this, it's important to try and pursue a variety of professional development. So you can do this either by um, assessing what you currently have and identifying the gaps where you may need to fill. So if you feel that you are really strong on the theory side, but that you lack some of the skills, there are opportunities available through, whether it be through webinars um, or more formal education that can help you about some of the skills that you need to implement. Um, but going back to Sabina's point, I think the ability to actually implement your skills, if you have the opportunity, whether this be through, through volunteering or internships or entry level jobs, to actually implement them is really important um, and really helpful. But if you do not have those opportunities, then pursuing professional development that is focused on skills as opposed to theory can be very helpful. So I think the, the answer is that you need a bit of a variety. There are, are lots of skills and approaches and theories that, um, that evaluators need. And I think if you can pursue a variety, that puts you in a good place to pursue those. Great. Um, production team, we've got someone asking for access to the workbook. Could I get the link popped back in the chat again, please? Ah, oh, thank you. You beat me to it, Maduka. Um, and we have another question here. Uh, the best way to influence policy making would be to start out as an evaluator and then move on to be a commissioner. Um, so to take such roles. I think that you can influence policy making as an evaluator. So as we discussed in that first module, there is a role for evaluators in influencing policy making by providing sound evidence that can be used in those processes. Um, and so I think, you know, as a commissioner, you can move into those areas and ensure that you are using evaluation um, evidence. But I think you can also influence as an evaluator by providing that evidence. Um, so I hope I hope that answers your question. Um, yes, it does. Thank you. Sure, thanks. Um, any suggestions on handling large data sets? Um, I do not have much experience, um, to be honest, with, with large data sets. Um, this is another one of those specific skills that there can be a lot of professional development opportunities about. So I would say keep monitoring for uh, webinars and professional development opportunities specifically related to that, if that's something that you are, are struggling with or that you identify that you need to strengthen, then I uh, keep scanning for those opportunities. So sign up for all the mailing lists and VOPAs, all of those things, um, but also keep looking online as well. Um, there is, especially in the times of COVID, there are a lot of uh, professional development opportunities online. So I would encourage you to look into those specifically. Thanks. Sure. Okay, so we're going to move on now. Um, if I could get the production team to please post the, the next poll question. So we've got a couple of questions for you about your career progression. Um, again, to understand who we have in the room and where people are interested to go. Great, we've got those responses coming in. Okay, we look like we've got a little bit of a lag. So if there's any last people that would like to vote in the poll, please do so, otherwise I will we'll close the voting. Okay, that looks like it. Um, so I'm going to end that one and show you what you all said. 
Um, so as you can see from the results, we have um, a lot of people that have only worked in one area of evaluation. Uh, this is to be expected with young and emerging evaluators. But it is also good to see that we have some people who have got more varied experience who have worked in two or three or more areas of evaluation. So that is um, really interesting. And I think that will contribute to some of the discussions later in the, the modules. Um, so it will be helpful to hear from people that have more varied experience in the exercises. Um, but not to um, mention that the people who have one area, we'd still really love your, your valuable contributions. Um, and so that is um, very helpful. So thank you for participating in that poll. I think what we're going to do is we're going to launch the next poll if we could. Um, and this is looking uh, more forward looking as to where you would like to go next. You should all be seeing the question about where you want to go next. Okay, looks like responses are slowing down a little on that one. Um, so last call for anybody who would like to submit into the poll. Okay, that looks like about everybody that's going to submit. Okay, so we can see from, from these results that there is actually a relatively even split about people who would like to move to a different area or people who would like to work in the same area. Um, so I hope that this has been helpful for you to identify that there are different areas that you can move into, but it is also nice to see that so many of you are, are happy where you are currently working and that you, you want to keep working on that side. Um, so I'm interested in if people are working on the evaluation, evaluator supply or demand side or somewhere else. Um, so if anyone would like to, to unmute and talk a little about their career pathway to date or um, pop in the chat if you are currently working as an evaluator and you want to stay on the supply side or if you want to shift. Um, so if anyone would like to share anything. Um, please feel free to do so, otherwise we will move through to a bit of a break. Seeing a um, message in the chat from Ms. Somi, uh, thank you for, for this, this is helpful. So this says that um, a lot of the entry-level jobs in India seem to be a, a one-man job. So the entry-level positions require one person designing, handling and implementing. That's an interesting observation. So you feel that they're is not the same level of supervision or guidance that you would expect for a entry level role. Is that is that what you feel from from those descriptions? Feel free to to reply in the chat, um, Swami, or or unmute yourself. Uh, and meanwhile, I can see, oh, sorry. Um, ah, okay, so you feel that there is not the level of supervision that you would expect um, and the level of supervision or guidance that you would maybe need as a young evaluator. That's an interesting point. And I think that comes to um, you having to have a lot of confidence in your own skills to be able to, to do those things without that level of supervision or guidance. Um, and so I hope that coming through our next modules that this will, will help. Um, I can see that Sabina has raised her hand. Did you want to unmute and say something, Sabina? Yeah, hello. Yes, hello. I was uh, uh, thinking that uh, to evaluate you need a uh, national system, developed uh, national system uh, for uh, evaluators and uh, also uh, the legal framework, which in uh, Romania we still don't. And uh, uh, evaluation uh, means, at least for beginners, to work uh, with uh, the Euro European Commission or uh, other. Uh, international organization for now. 
Okay, that's really interesting. So you feel that there's not many national level positions available um, because the systems aren't set up, but you have found a ways around that with looking at some of the larger uh, organisations which do operate in your country. That's, yeah, a, that's, correct. that's a really interesting thought and a really good example of, of overcoming challenges. So, so well done and thank you for sharing that experience. Um, I'm just going to catch up a little bit on some of these chat messages. So a couple of people saying that the um, they are echoing the experiences that Msomi um, shared about the lack of guidance and supervision. Um, so I, as I mentioned, I hope that the uh, the modules that will will follow will build your confidence in your skills uh, and will will help you to feel that you can fill those roles. Okay, great. A lot of other people sharing their experiences as well um, about where you want to go next, um, where you're not currently working, but you would like to keep moving. Um, great. Lots of people wanting to increase their involvement in evaluation, which is really great. Yatin, thank you for sharing that um, very few organisations have planned for m &E, so you end up doing a lot, lot more. Uh, and so there's not as many seniors who can guide you. So that's where a lot of the external um, self-driven professional development comes in. Great, someone just about to start an evaluation um, career in public transport, that's very exciting. Um, lots of people sharing their experiences, that's great. And we've got a question here. It's possible for a person who has expertise in a specific area to move as a senior level evaluator in a short period. I can't speak to the short period part as much, um, but it is definitely possible to, to shift. Um, it does take a concerted effort and a focus, um, looking at the skills and experience that you need to build between roles um, and focusing on those. Um, so I think it is possible, but it is maybe a bit more time, timely. Um, it does take a bit more time. Um, how do we build credibility and break through the M&E market? Uh, that's a good question, Tashi, uh, and something that a lot of people have questions about. Uh, and I think really identifying those opportunities for volunteering and internships uh, can really help and to build your skills as much as you can through professional developments and webinars, those kinds of things. Um, but really identifying those opportunities for the experience um, and to be able to demonstrate that can build your credibility. I'm going to have to pop us up there uh, so that we can go and have a, a quick break. Um, so we've got a five minute break coming up uh, and then we'll be back to talk about some core competencies. So I will skip over the questions because we have just covered some of those. So a five minute break. Take us back to, um, sorry, I've lost my time zones here. I think we're at um, about 10.38 or something. Is that right? Um, if, sorry, one of the production teams can confirm that that's five minutes. 10.39, Amanda, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I will see you all back at 10.39. Okay, I hope that everybody is feeling a little refreshed after a brief break. Um, and that everybody is coming back to their computers. Um, I will give you just a, a moment to get settled again. Okay, so welcome back. Um, thank you firstly for your active participation during those first two modules. Um, and I look forward to that con continuing into the, the next two. These ones are even more um, participatory. There will be opportunities for breakout rooms and similar. So moving on to module three, we're going to talk about some of the core competencies of professional evaluators. So what are some of those key skills that evaluators um, need to have? So firstly, we're going to have a look at um, a bit of an overview about what competencies are. Uh, so broadly, competencies are a set of skills and attributes for successful, ethical and professional evaluators. Competencies are different from standards. So they refer to more about the practices, ethics and behaviours for conducting evaluations, whereas competencies are more internal looking um, to the attributes of the individual evaluator. Competencies are important for ensuring a high quality of evaluation and providing guidance for professional development. 
So you will see as we move through this module how you can use the competencies to identify what professional development you may need to pursue. Um, also to note that there are many different competency frameworks. Um, there's some examples listed there below, um, but there are many more. Um, so what I have done with this training is drawn together some of the similarities um, of these frameworks. Um, look at some of the broad competency domains. So these are categories of competencies which a professional developer, uh, sorry, a professional evaluator will need to pursue. Okay, so there are six broad um, domains. The first is evaluative attitude and reflective learning. Next is sound practice and uh, sorry, professional practice and sound management. That's followed by evaluation theory and knowledge. So this relates to one of the questions that was in the chat. So it is a part of being a professional evaluator but it is only one part of many to be able to be familiar with evaluation theory. There's technical evaluation skills, contextual awareness, interpersonal skills, and these things all link to um, provide a professional evaluator. It's also important to note that, as I mentioned, these are only categories of competencies. And there are more specific skills under each of these. And this is where a lot of the variation between frameworks is. So for today's session, we're just going to work on these at this domain level, um, because there is a lot of detail under each of these that we do not have time to, to cover. So I encourage you to, to look into other competency frameworks. If you, there is one that is um, local to your context, then please look it up um, and you can have a read of some of the more, um, more detailed information in each of those. So I will run through each domain in a little more detail so that we understand a little more about what we are talking about. So the first, first domain is evaluation, attitude and reflective learning. And so this refers to having an interest in critical thinking being committed to evaluative thinking, being self-aware and continuing reflective learning for continuous improvement. This is something that we will delve into a lot more tomorrow, where we look at your own self-awareness uh, self in comparison to the domains, the competency domains, but it does come up as a particular thing under this domain. Broader promotion of the potential of evaluation and advocating for evaluation use. So this is something that an evaluator can, can pursue and should pursue to be a well-rounded professional. And building evaluation capacity in others. So this links a little with what I said before about the sustainability of evaluation, to be able to pass some of the skills that you are learning onto others involved in evaluation is a really important role. So this domain is a lot more um, kind of looking at your own motivations and your own attitudes. Uh, some of the others are a bit more, more technical in nature, but this is very much related to your attitudes. The second domain is professional practice and sound management. And this relates to um, being able to identify and apply appropriate evaluation tools and approaches. So this refers to being aware of those tools and approaches and about when to apply them. It's also about adhering to professional standards. So some of those include independence, credibility, neutrality, ethical practice. These are all really important standards for evaluators to uphold, not only for good evaluation practice, but for the professionalization of the sector as well. Having a commitment to transparency, inclusiveness, and appropriate use of evidence. And this is motivated by your contribution to good evaluation practice and the broader potential of evaluation. So these points all relate to the professional practice aspect of this domain. 
Being able to identify limitations in your methodologies and being able to mitigate those effectively is also an important aspect of this domain. And then the sound management part refers to sound project management skills. And so this includes skills to define, negotiate, scope, plan and coordinate evaluation. These are important roles, uh, sorry, important skills for, for many roles, but also particularly as we were discussing for the uh, consultant pathway where you may be solely responsible for managing a project but they are useful skills for all evaluators to have. Uh, and that last one there is to provide leadership to guide an evaluation when required. And so again, as a team leader or as a, a higher level role, this one's particularly important, but it is important to be aware of at this stage of our careers as well. The next domain is um, evaluation theory. As I mentioned, this links with what we were already hearing from uh, in the chat, that there are many opportunities to learn about the theories, but bearing in mind that they are one part of the, uh, the domains and the competency frameworks, but that there are many more. And so this is about building your technical knowledge. This is in terms of the theoretical foundations, in terms of models, methods, and tools for evaluation. And also about systematic inquiry. So uh, being able to review literature and to interrogate logic and coherence, identify available data, understand data validity and reliability, and to systematically gather, analyze, and integrate data for informed findings. So these are all really key aspects of an evaluator's role. And so to be able to combine all of those makes you a, a strong evaluator and is really important for professional evaluators. The next one is um, technical evaluation skills. And so again, this refers to some of the more practical skills. Um, conduct an evaluation. So this is the ability to assess program evaluability, how to frame evaluation topics and questions, how to appropriately apply evaluation criteria, how to design and implement appropriate sampling methods. So you may already have experience in some of these and so it is good to know that they are situated more broadly within the professional evaluator competencies. Uh, another technical evaluation skill is to be able to engage relevant stakeholders. As I was mentioning at the start, this is a really important point for inclusiveness and equity and ensuring nobody is left behind and is an important part of good evaluation practice. Being able to develop evaluation design uh, in response to purpose and needs. So being able to adapt tools and approaches and methods as required credible, feasible, and culturally appropriate data analysis. Uh, they are all also very important points. And to be able to produce complete and balanced evaluation reports. And this refers a little bit to the good use of evidence as well. So you can see that there are some overlaps between the competency domains, um, but that they, they all contain specific things under each domain. And this is why I really encourage you to look into the frameworks further. The next domain is related to contextual awareness, um, particularly important uh, given that we were talking about the new context that evaluation can take you to. So being able to maintain that contextual awareness is important. So this is understanding that the interventions and evaluations aren't done in isolation and understanding that there's influences that are external to whatever you are evaluating that can impact on that. To be able to adopt culturally appropriate approaches, respond to and respectfully operate in the broader context, understand and handle complexity and systems. This one again links with one of the key shifts in the evaluation landscape that I was saying that is becoming 
more and more in demand is the ability to be able to evaluate complexity in systems. And so this is a really important point under this competency domain. And to be able to clarify diverse perspectives, stakeholder interests and perceptions, and to be able to understand some of the influencing factors here as well is very important. To be able to identify and attend to the way power and privilege operate in the evaluation context. So this is another um, important aspect of understanding the external um, factors and context that may influence the intervention that you're evaluating. To be able to identify and address changes in evaluation context over time. So being able to acknowledge that the context that you were evaluating in has not always been the context and that there are changes over time. And to be able to understand contextual factors that may impact the evaluation. So that draws together a lot of the dot points prior to it uh, about those external influences on um, what you are evaluating. Okay, the final domain here is interpersonal skills, um, which is important for any person to have, but equally important for any evaluator to have. So this refers to your communication skills for a range of stakeholders. So whether that be written or verbal communication um, and to be able to respond to a range of stakeholders and tailor your communication to your audience is very important. Uh, it also refers to skills for collaboration, facilitation, negotiation, and knowledge sharing, which are all really important parts of an evaluation process. To be able to respect all stakeholders and involve them in the evaluation process where possible. To be able to build relationships. To maintain an objective perspective is also very important. As I mentioned, to be able to use both written and verbal communication methods, the ability to actively listen, to be able to build trust and to manage conflicts constructively. So you can see that the interpersonal skills um, broadly fit into kind of two categories. There's the interpersonal skills of you as an evaluator with the other people involved in the evaluation process, so all stakeholders. But then there's also a bit of a sub um, category under that, which is about you as an evaluator working with other evaluators. So there's those two aspects to this domain to keep in mind. A lot of these points in relation to broader stakeholders. So the ability to actively listen, to build relationships, uh, to maintain an objective perspective. Those are really important points to be able to encourage people to share with you their experiences and to feel that they can trust you to share their candid thoughts about um, whatever it is that you are evaluating. Now with this slide, I thought I would just do a, a quick overview of how you can draw each discussion about each of these domains into your CV. Uh, so the evaluative attitude and reflective learning can really come into your motivation statement and professional development sections. So this is where you can really talk about your passion for evaluation and why you're motivated to pursue a particular role. Um, and also in the professional development, that is a way that you can demonstrate your reflective learning. The professional practice and sounds management can come into cover letters and key skills. So this is where you can really talk about your experiences with implementing management skills or um, conducting evaluations to a professional standard. So that's two sections there that you can really talk about those. Um, evaluation theory and knowledge. This can be brought in through cover letters, education and professional experience. So this is a little of a cross cutting one that because it's so much about theory and knowledge, it is relevant to your education, but you also need to be able to show that you have experience in implementing and using those theories and that knowledge. Uh, and so that comes in in your professional experience. Uh, the technical evaluation skills similarly come in 
through your cover letter and talking about how you have used those skills, your professional development about how you gained those skills, and your professional experience demonstrating that you can use those skills. Uh, contextual awareness comes in um, in your cover letter and your professional experience. So again, being able to demonstrate that you can effectively work across contexts. And the country experience can also help there as well. So if you have a section discussing where you have worked, that is the space to bring in discussion about contextual awareness. And on the interpersonal skills, this is important through your cover letter and your professional experience. So this, as I mentioned, is a, a comprehensive framework for a professional evaluator. But how do you go about addressing any gaps that you may identify? So the first stage of that is to actually identify your gaps, which is something we will be working on tomorrow. But if you do have gaps, there are, again, two considerations depending on which pathway you are on. So for an employee pathway, that may be to pursue tailored professional development and to identify opportunities within your organisation to build those experiences and work with others. For a consultant, it may be quite similar to be able to work with others and to build a team to be able to fill any gaps. So if you feel that you are particularly strong on some competencies, but maybe lagging on some others, you can identify team members who are strong on those. And together that makes you a really strong team to be able to um, apply for, for contracts and for roles. Okay, so we're going to use our first uh, breakout rooms here. Um, I see that we have ended up with about 70 participants. So we may have time for all groups to respond back when we come back, um, but we will see how we go. So um, if not going back to the process that I mentioned at the start, it was that there's four stages to your breakout room. If you could spend a few minutes introducing yourselves, so this may be your name, where you're from and why you are here today. Uh, number two is to identify someone as a facilitator and a documenter, and you will both be reporting back to the main groups. So these are really important roles to identify at the start. And then complete the exercise, including some discussions within your group. And then use the last kind of three to five minutes to identify what the three key points coming out from your discussions are. Uh, and then it will be the documenter's role to post those three points into the chat so that if we do not have time to hear from every, every group that we still have time, we still are able to hear your inputs. And a reminder to please take note of your group number before you split. So it will come to um, up on the screen. So please write that down somewhere so that the documenter can include that in their chat um, posting. Should I open the rooms now? Uh, just a moment, thanks, Yatin. Yeah. Uh, so I can see that Yatin has um, included a link in the chat. Um, and that includes this slide. So if you feel that you may forget one of those stages, I encourage you to, to click on that link um, before you break out. So then the actual exercise that we're going to be doing in the room is there is an example evaluation terms of reference in your workbook. Um, again, apologies if the page number is not um, current, but it was page 11. Um, and so I, we would like you to read that terms of reference and then describe in table two how you would apply each of the competency domains we've discussed to that situation. Um, so you'll see that it explains um, what the commissioner of the evaluation is looking for. And then it has a list of the competencies which you can write next to them, how you would apply them. Okay, I think we are ready for breakout rooms, please, um, production team. Um, there will be a member of the production team dropping into each breakout room as well. So if you have any questions, please ask uh, during the, the session. 
Great. It seems that we have everybody back now, I think. Is that right, Yutin? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, now, it was really interesting ducking into some of those sessions. Um, some of you found the exercise a little unclear and I am I'm sorry about that. I hope that you were all able to progress by the end of the breakout session. Um, if not, that is okay. We will um, discuss uh, those now. So I can see that somebody's already posting points in the chat from room three. So if you have your three discussion points, please um, feel free to pop those in the chat. Um, and if anybody would like to unmute and talk about what their, their group discussed during that session, then please also feel free to do that. Uh, so uh, this is Tashi from group number three. Uh, should I go first? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, uh, we, are, we were seven of us uh, with a mix from uh, Nepal, India, Af Africa, and Bhutan. So uh, we basically uh, discuss on the competency, competency domains. And uh, in this presentation, I would like to focus particularly on the first three competencies, uh, evaluative attitude and reflective learning, professional practice and management skills, and then evaluation knowledge. So uh, first, uh, we found out that from the TOR, uh, the evaluation is not participatory in the sense that uh, it requires uh, the evaluator to uh, conduct a survey-based evaluation. So there was no contact with participants. So uh, this was one of the uh, uh, I mean, uh, down point in the tour. And second on the pro professional practice and management skills, we've, uh, we felt that there's need to adopt co and contextualize approach to align with varying sociocultural aspects of different participating countries. Uh, here in the project, there are four participating countries. So we felt that while designing the evaluation approaches, this should be contextualized with the sociocultural needs of uh, different countries. And when it comes to evaluation knowledge, uh, we found that the evaluation is entirely based on the documents, which can be uh, biased as this initial, I mean, internal reports, which may include the evaluation reports and the periodic reports. So these are being prepared by the uh, project team and this can uh, go wrong. So this will have uh, misinformation or uh, I mean misguide the external funders or the external uh, evaluators. I mean uh, external stakeholders. And uh, in all in all, we uh, found out that this is some sort of a meta evaluation than the evaluation itself because these are entirely based on the uh, documents and which could also include the uh, evaluation report. So we feel that this is more of a meta evaluation. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. You obviously had a very fruitful discussion in group three um, and you did identify uh, some of the flaws with the terms of reference, which um, is good to hear. Um, and all of the points that you raised there were, were very valid and useful. So thank you for sharing those. Uh, does anybody from any of the other groups uh, want to either post their points in the chat or unmute um, and talk about what they discussed? I would like to speak about Team 5. Sure, please go ahead. Uh, the most uh, common between uh, our uh, team uh, uh, a point was uh, knowing the context and uh, having experienced uh, uh, evaluators uh, which know the region, we uh, do the evaluators. That's why uh, uh, we have agreed that uh, uh, it, it's necessary to find evaluators who worked before in Central Africa, for example. Uh, another uh, competence is uh, being able to, to team with uh, uh, the, the local evaluators' experience. Um, and knowing about uh, uh, evaluation criteria, identifying uh, uh, what methodology we should follow. Uh, uh, Beverly underlined, uh, for example, uh, that understanding the culture and who is our client uh, uh, is uh, an important skill and competency. We also uh, should have uh, skills to collect the data and uh, use the methodology. 
also interpersonal skills context uh, for understanding and being able to engage with uh, different uh, stakeholders, stakeholders uh, without bias. Uh, we have touched only the first uh, point, evaluative attitudes and reflective learning. Great, thank you. That also sounds like you had a good discussion. Um, and a lot of what you discussed at the start of that was about the contextual awareness competency domain. And that was a really important one here. So your point about bringing in more experienced evaluators or national evaluators who have uh, in-country experience is a very important one. So, so thank you for sharing that. Um, and identifying the methods, et cetera, is also a very important, important role and links a little with critically reviewing in terms of reference. So the methodology that they propose in the terms of reference, it sounds that you thought there may be some flaws in that methodology and that perhaps more would be needed. Uh, and so then you would have to use your interpersonal skills to negotiate and your sound management skills to negotiate any of those changes to that proposed methodology. So that is um, a very good discussion and a very good summary. So thank you very much for that. I can see there's been some more posts in the chat, but would uh, one more group like to, to unmute and discuss or summarize what they discussed in their group? Possibly not by the sounds of it. May I? <laughs> yes, please go yeah. ahead. <laughs> we are from the uh, room number seven. And Great. So we discussed the three main points. One is more about that uh, because we are conducting evaluation, for, especially focused on the vulnerable groups. We need to ensure that our, our work is very ethical and we incorporated the ethical approach. The second point is more about the context because it's uh, the, the project, the given project is uh, implemented in a different context in different regions. So identifying their context and understanding the stakeholders are the crucial thing to understand their issues and how they approach to the issues. So third point is more about that presenting and sharing the evaluation results, especially the one objective is more about uh, providing others opportunities to learn from our experience. So we need to be skill skilled in presenting the, our data and results and giving the others opportunities to uh, plan interventions in the future for similar groups. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much for that summary. Um, and so like the first group that we heard from, you identified some of the potential flaws in the terms of reference. Uh, and then you identified ways that your, uh, you could apply your competencies to overcome them. So in terms of the interpersonal skills and the contextual awareness. So that has been uh, very helpful. So thank you for feeding back there. Now, I will say that my time management competency domain has um, lapsed a little in this session and we are running a little behind schedule. So I'm going to skip over the next exercise, but you do have the materials in your workbook. So if after the session you would like to um, get a little bit more familiar with your competency domains and how you apply them, then please go back and complete the exercise about the the challenges and how you apply your domains, your competencies to overcome challenges. Uh, so I apologise that we do not have time to work through that in this session, but I do encourage you to, to complete that afterwards. What I do want to do though, is there is a, a brief individual exercise. Um, so I will just share my screen so that we are all talking about the same thing. Okay, so this was the exercise that we just did. Um, unfortunately, this is the exercise regarding challenges that we will have to skip over. Um, but there is an individual exercise, which is a bit of a self-assessment on the competency domains. And so there is a table that has the competency domains listed. And if you could go through and briefly rate yourselves between kind of one and 10 for each domain, um, that will be really helpful. We'll use this exercise again uh, in a module tomorrow. So if you could do that one, we will give you about five minutes and then we'll be moving on to a 10 minute break. So um, feel free to take a break once you finish. Um, 
And other than that, if you could complete that exercise, that would be great. Okay, hopefully that has given you enough time to complete that table. But if you um, do need a little longer, uh, feel free to, to take it. We are just going to be taking a, a brief 10 minute break. Okay, hello everybody, welcome back. Um, again, I'll give you just a, a moment to resettle after the, the break. Um, but if you can bring your cup of coffee with you, that would be, be great and we'll, we'll start again in a moment. Okay, so as with the last break, I hope you are all feeling refreshed and ready to go. This is the final module for today. So we are uh, on the home stretch and I hope you are um, still, still here and still uh, ready to engage and participate in this next module. Uh, so this next module is about building technical knowledge and skills. So this is some of the more practical ways that you can identify um, professional development opportunities um, and how you can prioritise those. Uh, sorry, my computer is just having a moment here. Let me, here we go. Okay, so first I wanted to talk a little bit about education and certification. So there's often lots of questions about if formal university educations are required and how you go about identifying those and finding those. So I think what's important to note is that formal university education that is specifically related to evaluation, so whether that be a bachelor or master's degree in evaluation, are often not required. And I think this stems from historically a limited av availability of evaluation specific university education opportunities. Um, and so as a result, while there is generally a requirement for a university degree and evaluation experience, the degree doesn't have to be specifically in evaluation. It's often that a related, a degree in a related field plus evaluation experience is often a, a good combination um, to um, set you forward towards a career in evaluation. So I think that's the first point to note is that there are not many university degrees specific to evaluation. Um, if you can find one and can enrol in one, that is great, but it is not necessarily required. Um, and the reason that these uh, degrees in related fields often hold true in evaluation is because many of the skills that you develop in university in general are applicable to evaluation. So for instance, I did a international development degree and we still learned about things like critical thinking and analysis and self-reflection, all of which come up in the evaluator competencies and are important for a professional evaluator. So many of the skills that you learn through other university degrees are applicable. And if you can find opportunities to demonstrate experience in using those skills, um, then that is uh, really good for moving forward with a career in evaluation. It's also important to note that there's lots of non-university trainings available. Uh, so through opportunities such as IPDET or the International Academy for Monitoring and Evaluation, there is a um, list in your uh, workbook of some useful links to, to training opportunities and to university degrees, etc. Um, but they are only a selection. There is a lot of training opportunities out there, not necessarily through university, but other trainings. And so I really encourage you to, to have a look. Um, you can use some of the links as a starting point, but look beyond those as well. Okay, so some of these other options include things like webinars. As I mentioned, these are becoming more and more prevalent um, during COVID. These online learning opportunities, uh, advisory sessions, so like the P2P Plus movement, even just forums, conferences. So you are here today, so you obviously are um, passionate about pursuing a career in evaluation. Uh, and you're already using one of these options, which is great. So just to know that there are other options out there. Uh, and joining your professional networks is often how you can find out about these. So the overarching point from this is that 
a combination of these less formal online tools, um, such as the webinars, in combination with a formal degree, not necessarily in evaluation, can be uh, really useful and that can place you in a, a good place to move forward with a career. Okay, so next we're going to have a quick look at some learning style. So understanding your learning style can be really helpful to identify which learning opportunities are best suited to you and which you are going to gain the most from because they are um, tailored to your style. So there are three broad learning style categories. Uh, that's auditory, so that's people who prefer to listen to instructions um, and they like to be able to repeat instructions back and that's how they learn and how they understand. Visual learners like to see what they are learning. And so that's things like graphics, diagrams, infographics, videos, those kind of means really work for visual learners. Uh, and then the kinesthetic learners are learners who are very tactile. They like to experience what they're learning. So uh, this may be the people that learn most by doing. Um, and so that's the, the three broad categories there. And like I said, it's really helpful to identify which category you are. And so what I would like to do now is if we can post the link in the chat to this online quiz, um, it will come up with a home page and then there's a box at the bottom that says 20 questions. You click on that one and it will take you through a, a brief quiz which will help you to identify which type of learner you are and this can help you to prioritise your future professional development opportunities. Great. Okay, it seems like most people have, have finished that exercise now. Um, and so as I mentioned, this can help you to um, identify which training courses may be most appropriate for you and may be most effective for you. So as you are looking at the training courses, they may say that they uh, use a lot of diagrams or that they have videos in them or that they have hands-on exercises. So as you are reading those descriptions, you can identify which may be most effective for you based on your learning style. So I'm going to, to move along in the um, interest of keeping to time this time this module around. So next, we're going to have a quick look at some um, basic models for, for building knowledge and skills. And so again, this can help you to identify where you feel you are currently at and where you may need to move next in your professional development based on, on whichever model you feel you are following or you work best with. So there's two broad models that I'm going to talk about. Um, so the first is foundational knowledge. And this really focuses on mastering and consolidating the skills that you already have and using those as a foundation to build on. So this may be that you, you want to learn everything that there is about one topic so that then you can build on that with additional skills related to that topic. So that's one model. The second model is called subskills. And so this is related to building discrete but related sets of knowledge and skills that can be combined and applied in different ways. And so this is about developing kind of separate skills that you can adapt and combine as needed to apply to a particular situation through applicable knowledge. So that's the, the two, the one of wanting to know everything about one and then building up. And the second is what knowing a little bit about a lot of things that you can apply and adapt as you need. Okay, now this next slide is a really important one. So I thought I would touch on this in terms of building technical knowledge and skills. This is about keeping up to date. So we mentioned right at the start that evaluation is continually evolving. There's always new approaches, new kind of buzzwords, new methods being tried. And so it's really important that you maintain this in your professional development. So it's exciting because it means there's always opportunities for learning new things. Um, but it does mean that it's a concerted effort to keep up to date sometimes. 
But remember that this doesn't have to be formal learning. It can be informal learning such as webinars, which may only take an hour to keep up to date with, but you'll be much more familiar with an approach or a method or a buzzword. And if you hear about it, you can go, ah, yes, I did that webinar there. And I can, I feel like I can apply that and I know that. So um, it's really important skill to have is to be able to maintain a focus on, on what the upcoming issues are. You can also keep up to date based on the skills that you have and any gaps that you identify and your future career plans. So we'll touch on this a little bit more tomorrow in the self-assessment um, module, but it can help you to identify your skills and the gaps, and then you can tailor those and fill those gaps as you need to be able to reach your career ambitions. Next about implementing and building skills. So this is related a little bit to one of the questions from the chat earlier about um, learning and practicing at the same time. So as I mentioned, I think that experience is really important. It's for many reasons, but it provides you an opportunity to demonstrate the skills that you have. It can also assist you to identify gaps in your skills. So you may feel like you, you have this skill um, down and you, you know how to use it. And then you go to use it in practice and you realize that actually you may need to strengthen one part of it. So it can help you to identify those gaps and then you can address them. It also formalizes skills. So to be able to demonstrate that you can use a skill um, is a lot stronger than just to be able to say that you have learned this skill um, in theory. It also can show that you can implement skills in different contexts. So if you can adapt the skill to the specific context, that's a, a really positive point. And it can also give you the opportunity to use your skills to a professional standard. Um, so this links a little bit with the um, identifying gaps, but it means that actually implementing the skill can be quite a different experience to just learning about the skill. Uh, and so then you can understand what is required to de deliver that skill to a high standard. Okay, now we're going to do another set of breakout rooms here. So again, um, much the same process of spend a couple of moments introducing yourselves, nominate someone who can be the facilitator and the documenter, conduct the exercise, and identify your three key points for feeding back to the main session. And again, remember to, to take note of your group number so that we know who we're hearing from when you report back. So the exercise that we're going to be doing in this breakout room is in your workbook, there is an example evaluation job advertisement. Uh, so this has the skills that are required, the tasks that are um, intended for the, the new person in the role, uh, some background to the information, uh, sorry, to the organisation. So have a read of that one. And then in your groups, make a list of the skills that you think are needed. So there's a box there for you to pop the skills in. And then after that, there are three example CVs for um, three possible candidates for this job. So then use the next table, table five, to identify where each candidate meets the skill requirements, where there may be some gaps that they may need to identify and fill. And then based on that table, identify who you would hire for the position and why. So we're going to give you about 20, 25 minutes for this one. Um, and so I will ask the production team to please um, send everybody out into the breakout rooms. Okay, great. That looks like that is most people back in the main room, I think. Um, so if you would like to share in the chat, um, which candidate your group hired and a little bit about why, um, then please go ahead to post that in the chat. Um, if you didn't get that far, that is okay. Feel free to post something else that you were, were discussing. Um, and would any group like to unmute and share um, either who they, who they hired or uh, what their discussion focused on?
uh, I can go for group one, Amanda. Yeah. Sure. Thanks, Ms. Yeah. So we heard the third candidate, uh, An Yuan. She's Vietnamese, so more familiar with the Asian context where the project is being implemented. Uh, also has very relevant experience uh, of one year in monitoring and evaluation. And, you know, she has been performing pretty much all the tasks that are required for this particular position. Has a good experience of working with donors such as USAID uh, and has specifically worked in MNE database. Uh, stakeholder engagement, you know, working with different stakeholders, uh, developing and implementing data collection tools, but has also worked as a university director, so she can also, you know, teach other people, which is, again, one of the requirements for uh, for this particular position. For the others two, uh, the first one is uh, that both of them are, like, not... Uh, do not have relevant context. They come from Canada and Netherlands, so they might not be very familiar. It's just an assumption, of course, might not be very familiar with uh, the Asian context. But also, uh, they are not fulfilling all the requirements. The first one has only internship experience. Uh, but the second one is experience, but it's more specialized, you know, more focused in research, only in data collection, but uh, does not fulfill other requirements such as working with different stakeholders uh, and uh, as well as you know training other people so yeah based on these requirements we are going to hire the third candidate on you one yeah great thank you Ms. yeah it sounds like you had a very um, thorough discussion and look at all of the cvs and the job descriptions so that's great thank you uh, and it also seems like group five in the chat was uh, echoing much of, of what you said. So everybody was thinking along the same lines there. Um, and I think Gandhi from India, you had your, your hand up. Did you want to say something? Yes. Uh, I'm from uh, group two who's representing and having discussions on required skills and uh, who's the better candidate for the role. So uh, the discussion ended up with uh, selecting candidate three, the whatever the reasons were morally, uh, Mr. Nazir was uh, uh, like good friend. But another, the main reason, another one of the reasons which we thought this as an MNE expert, he should have uh, experience in different fields, not just uh, restricted to a specific domain. And uh, third candidate has that exposure to the different uh, projects working in different places. So the, I just want to put it in. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Um, and so it seems that the contextually aware competency domain of the um, of candidate number three was really what sold a lot of you on, um, on that candidate. So it's interesting to hear that you had quite a, a good discussion around that. Uh, we've had another post in the chat from Garima. Um, not quite enough time, that's okay. Um, feel free to, to go back for the fun of it if you would like to go and, and hire somebody um, after the session. Um, but discuss the, the context and the related skills. So that echoes what we've already been hearing. Um, so experience working in the context, local knowledge and language. That's a good point about the contextually aware part. Um, and interest in this sector and experience working with similar projects. So all very good points there, thank you. Um, I'm probably going to say this name wrong, but shall, um, oh, now you've disappeared. Someone had their hand up, sorry. Uh, would uh, you like Chen, to unmute and share? Yeah, yeah, you asked me. Yes, so please sorry. go ahead. Uh, I think uh, Tashi Dendrup, our facilitator has already, you know, uh, typed in the chat box, but then like, yes, just like other groups, we have also, picked candidate three to be the most suitable person for the job. Uh, it is, we had uh, like different opinions and we were weighing between candidate two and three and then candidate two, we uh, did not pick that because uh, we felt like PhD person is uh, like overqualified as Amanda mentioned in the earlier presentation saying like, I mean, he obviously is just the starting phase of the thing. And then we felt that he's uh, overly qualified Moreover, his field experience are, experiences are not relevant to the, you know, job, which is uh, requirements of the job. So we have picked candidate three, mainly because uh, he or she is from Vietnam and then he or she will be much more familiar to the Asian context. And moreover, 
she has uh, like more of field experience in uh, in terms of you know, relevancy for the job and then uh, she meets the experience of a uh, minimum of three years experience so i think uh, like these these are the points and then uh, some other points are just the same as uh, the previous presenters have mentioned thank you great thank you very much for sharing um and so it seems that you had some similar points to Nazia, where although candidate two had perhaps more experience, it was not necessarily relevant experience. So you can see how that can, can be quite an influencing factor in the end. Um, and so I hope you have found this exercise useful and I hope that you have the opportunity going forward to do a similar exercise for yourself. So if you are looking to apply for a role that you can map out the skills and the knowledge that are required for that role and look at this against your own CV. And so this is a way that you can either strengthen your CV and identify professional development opportunities that you may need to pursue to strengthen your CV further to align with the requirements of a position. So I hope that that has been helpful. We are very almost at the end of this session. So I'm going to do a quick conclusion and wrap up and we'll talk about what we're going to move forward to, to tomorrow. Okay. Sorry, I'm way back at the end of the last module. Let me get to the right slide here. Okay, so I hope that you have found today useful. Uh, what we have uh, started with today was looking at your, your motivation for wanting to pursue an evaluation career uh, and looking at what some of the contributions of good evaluation practice can be and how you specifically can contribute to those. We then moved through into module two to look at what some of the careers in evaluation may be, uh, what a pathway through these careers may look like and what the progression may be. And you did the exercise looking at the career landscape and identifying uh, where you would like to go next in very broad terms. And we will delve into that a little deeper tomorrow. So it's a good start to have that one um, down already. And then in module three, we talked about some of the core competencies. You applied those to a real situation. There is that additional exercise there that we did not get to today. So if you would like to learn more and become more familiar with the competencies, then please use that exercise about challenges. Uh, and so we identified those six key domains of competencies that it, uh, a professional evaluator needs to possess. And then in module four, we looked a little more about uh, building technical knowledge and skills and identifying ways to do this and how you can prioritize future professional development opportunities based on your learning style and perhaps the strengths and gaps in your own skills and where you need to fill those. So looking forward to tomorrow, we've covered modules one to four there. And so we're going to be covering modules five and six tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow is a little more participatory um, and I look forward to further engagement from you. Uh, so thank you very much firstly for today for, for engaging and participating actively. It's been great to get to know some of you through today and I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. I will pass back now to um, was it Estella who is going to be wrapping up. Yes, thank you, Amanda. Thank you for very uh, uh, interesting and uh, interactive uh, training uh, session. I could see that uh, many uh, participants joined and also uh, uh, actively engage in discussions and uh, sessions. Uh, I wish I had this training uh, uh, session when I started my career, but uh, definitely uh, the young and emerging evaluators nowadays are very lucky and fortunate to have this uh, kind of training when they start their many career. And as I mentioned in the morning, so this is a new uh, training module uh, developed by Amanda uh, for, uh, in part, uh, as, is, you know, as part of uh, the initiative uh, uh, with the partnership of UNFPA Evolution Office, uh, GI, uh, Global Evaluate Network and B2B Network. So this is a great uh, uh, opportunity for you all to join this and uh, very interesting sessions. So I hope you all enjoyed and learned a lot. And tomorrow we will continue again uh, at 9 a.m. India Standard Time. 
Uh, with that note, uh, I would like to thank all the participants, our production team, and Amanda for great session again and a uh, lot of hard uh, work and uh, preparation, Amanda. You know, uh, we can see that definitely. And looking forward to the tomorrow's session. Thank you.